Mighty Merp is available on iTunes, Spotify, and all your favorite apps and players. But the best way to experience the show is to visit MightyMerp.com. That's MightyMerp.com. Well, I'm here with Stephanie Albert Pedrick, who is an owner and operator of her own law firm, Law Offices of Stephanie Albert Pedrick. And I thought we could have a good conversation today about being a solo practitioner and sort of uh, how you decided to open up your own law firm, what made you think it was the right decision, um, and a little bit about your history and uh, where you are now. So. Um, okay. I know we've talked about being small business owners together. And uh, so tell me your origin story. Where did you, um, you know, where did you grow up? <laughs> How did you decide to become a lawyer? Okay. So I grew up in Ocean City, New Jersey. I uh, graduated from Ocean City High School. And I did not think that I wanted to be a lawyer. In fact, my sort of, I was always interested in law, but I sort of thought that I would go into law enforcement and be a police officer. Um, I, you know, grew up on uh, Cagney and Lacey and Hill Street Blues, and uh, those were the police shows of my generation. Um, so I went to college, I went to Glassboro State, which is now Rowan University, mm -hmm. and pursued law and justice. But when you have a bachelor's degree in law, there's not really anything that you can do with that. Um, and upon graduation, I wasn't ready to, to do anything else. I didn't want to go to law school right away. So I um, had worked in the summers as a summer police officer in Ocean City. And so they, you know, were good enough to take me in as a 911 dispatcher. So I worked as a dispatcher in Ocean City when 911 was really just getting started. And I did that for a couple of years, left there and went to work at a lo local law office, just doing like as a billing clerk, you know, helping out with their billing on a monthly basis. And from there I became a legal secretary. And then that's when I said, you know what, I wanna go to law school. So there was a seven year gap for me between college and law school. Um, well, it's amazing you found a job after college. And I say this, I, I taught at Rowan I actually taught in the law and justice department. I taught there for a number of years from like 2006 to 2013, which I know is okay. after you because it was already Rowan. Yeah. And um, <laughs> aside from my students that know they want to go to law school or know they want to be police officers or probation officers, sort of the unknown, it is so kind of hard to find a job within this field if you're not having right. that specialty of being law enforcement, yeah. probation, you know. And um, I, I think the fact think? that I had worked in the summer gave me the, the foot in the door with the police department to get hired as the dispatcher. So, so uh, what type of law firm did you work at? When I first started, well, I clerked for a year. Um, in civil. No, and not, then, not when you graduated law school. I mean, prior when you were a paralegal. Oh, I, it was a um, personal injury defense firm, um, medical malpractice. It was at the time, I, can I say the name of the firm? Because it is a local office. Absolutely. Sure, okay. It was Savio Reynolds and Drake, um, which oh, is in Absecon. Mm -hmm. um, so now I think it's just the Drake law firm. I believe, or maybe it's still Reynolds and Drake, but uh, at the time, Jim Savio was there, who is now a judge, a Superior Court judge. Steve He's Drake and Tom Reynolds. He's a retired Ross. Superior Court judge. That's right. He is retired. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, they did medical malpractice and personal injury defense. Um, so, you know, that was my background. It was litigation. Well, it's amazing that that encouraged you to go to law school. In my mind, I would find <laughs> that the most boring type of law. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing personal for anyone who handles that type of law, yeah. but for me, I'd be like, uh, you know. So, I enjoyed it. And then uh, where did you go to law school? Widener University, Widener Law School, which I think is now Delaware Law School. It is now Delaware, Delaware Law School, Widener. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and I also taught there. So, <laughs> um, and you clerked after your uh, law school experience? Right. And who did you clerk for? Judge Daryl Todd in the civil division. 
Mm -hmm. in Atlantic City. And did you know you wanted civil? Or did you think you wanted civil? For my clerkship? Just practicing. You went to law school um, with what idea? I went to law school thinking I was going to come out and do exactly what I had done, you know, working as a legal secretary. So, uh, yeah, civil was my interest at that time. Family was the last thing I ever thought that I would do. <laughs> you said I was interested in policing and criminal. I was right. interested in civil. So, um, and I, sometimes it just happens to be where you get your first full-time job. But what happened after your clerkship? So after my clerkship, I worked for another local firm doing insurance defense litigation down in Tuckahoe. It was Powell, Birchmeyer and Powell. Worked there for about a year and a half. Um, then I left and I, I was, did a brief stint at Hank and Sandman and Palladino in Atlantic City. Uh, was there for a year and then, um, I met my husband, um, and sort of refocused and, and found a new job. And I went in house with an insurance company again, doing insurance defense. So really my, the early part of my career was, litigation, insurance defense, a little bit of plaintiff work, but um, primarily insurance defense. And then um, I left there and I got hired locally at um, the Youngblood firm, which is the, it was Youngblood um, Lafferty and Sam Poli at the time that I was hired back in 2008. So I was there for nine years doing insurance defense litigation, you know, so really the, the bulk of my career um, up until 2011, I'll say, or 2013 was um, insurance defense primarily. So there, the ultimate question <laughs> is, how did you get into how doing did I get family? Here? Um, so when I was at that firm in Linwood at the Youngblood firm, they um, were sort of taking over some files from another local attorney who was closing up his office, and he had a number of family files. And so the partners came to me and said, you know, we would like for you to try these family cases. We think that you'd be good at that. And I just looked at them and said, you have got to be kidding me. That is the last thing that I want to do. Um, That's but they <laughs> really good team playing there. So. Yeah, I'm like, <laughs> no. <laughs> And they just said, would you please just try it? If you really hate it, we'll figure something out, but please just try it. I said, fine. So I took a couple of CLE courses. I mean, this was like, you know, really foreign to me at the time. Um, took a few educational courses and spoke to some local family law attorneys to sort of get some advice and get my feet under me. And then I started. And much to my surprise, I enjoyed it. You know what's funny is, or not funny, but what's great about um, our community, the Atlantic County, Cape May County community is you really can talk, call most local attorneys mm -hmm. and ask them questions about their area of law. And they are yeah. always willing to share their knowledge and uh, to help you out. So it's true. Um, so you started in 2011 handling family cases. Roughly, you yeah. are now certified as a family certified uh, matrimonial by the Supreme law Court. attorney. As, yep. Yes, um, which means you have recognized as an expert by the Supreme Court, which means you've done a lot of work in the twelve years. Yeah, I, you could say that. I mean, I know you're certified as well, so it's not an easy task to get that certification. Um, but I'm proud of that. Yeah. So um, how big was the young blood firm when you were there? It had, um, there was probably about six lawyers at the time when I left in 2017. Okay. Um, there and was, what, yeah. What made you decide that it was time for you to leave? I was starting to feel, you know, I had the family law work and it was growing. And I was just starting to feel like more confident, I guess, in myself as not just as a lawyer, but as a, as a person, you know, that I could, I could accomplish more. And 
I wanted to be the one to make decisions. You know, I, I wanted to be the ones to decide, you know, what type of practice management software we would use or, you know, things like that. Um, so I just sort of had been thinking about it and thinking about it and starting to do a little bit of research and um, kind of came to the conclusion that I wanted to give it a try, which let me tell you, you know, you, you have to think about that for a long time because at the time I had two, ki two kids and, you know, a mortgage to pay and daycare to pay. And I didn't take that decision lightly. Um, but I knew I had the support of my husband. And so I went for it. Was it something that you kind of felt on your own? Was there anything um, that you felt pushing you to do it? Or, I mean, you know, I always admired what you when you went out on your own because it seemed like such a personal decision and it takes such confidence to do it. And um, we've talked about it. And, you know, I did it. Um, I think I did it begrudgingly. Like, I didn't really have a choice <laughs> when I did it. It worked out amazingly. But um, I think if I wasn't pushed in a way that I had to do it, I don't know if I ever would have done it without you know mm -hmm. literally being pushed off the cliff right. well no one pushed me you know it was um I, I would just say circumstances had occurred over a period of time and knowing that i was building my practice it just sort of came to be that i thought i need to try this on my own i think i can do it i want to try it on my own i want to be my own boss and be the one to make the choices that are going to impact me and my career. You know, if they're a good choice or a bad choice, then it's me that's making that choice. Right. Um, so um, I made the decision to do it. How, how do you think someone knows if you were going to give advice to a younger attorney that they're ready or that they should do it? I think every situation is different. You know, um, I think, People that are curious, then there's that spark inside them that obviously they have that entrepreneurial spirit or whatever you want to call it. I I certainly didn't have that all along. You know, that sort of developed over time with me. Um, but in terms of whether it's whether you're ready to do it, I think you have to have confidence in yourself as a lawyer, you know, in the in the basic skills that you have. And then you have to think about your circumstances you know do you have people depending on you like do you have little children that uh <laughs> need you to uh send them to daycare and and put food on the table and do you have a mortgage and what's going to happen if it doesn't work you know mm -hmm. um so i had spoken to my husband and at the time so he's a teacher um and i know some teachers you know can spread out their paychecks over the course of a year He's a 10 month, you know, paycheck employee. So um, at the time I had this conversation with him, I think it was in June. And he said, just wait until I go back to work in September before you do this. So that's what I did. And that was good. You know what? It gave me a timeline and I worked backwards from the time that I wanted to open my door. I picked October 1st and then I just worked backwards and got myself ready over the summer to do it. Um, what was the hardest thing about starting your own firm? Um, I think getting a handle on how to do, like what the legal requirements are. Um, I was scared that I, you, you, and you can't just open up a door and, you know, say you're out there, you know, you have to form a business and you have to get a tax ID number. And so it was that kind of stuff that was, foreign to me that I was scared about that, you know, am I making a mistake and, and whatnot, but I figured it out. <laughs> yes. I think again, you just ask people questions, right? A lot of questions, a lot of looking online and, um, you know, and like, you know, people are helpful. People that have their own business are willing to help other people. And I think that's really great. Um, so when you opened up your practice, did you think, I'm going to just stick with family law? Did you think you were going to expand? Have you expanded beyond 
um, is your focus family law? My focus is family law. you have the experience law. in defense and other areas in civil defense. So true. Uh, you know, maybe if a, a personal injury case came across my desk initially, I would have thought about it. But, you know, personal injury lawyers generally get paid on, um, you know, a percentage basis. It's contingent, you know, there's no guarantee. And I I just wasn't willing to take that risk, you know, to take on a case and work on it and not be sure whether I was going to get paid. So I I preferred to refer those to others, let them handle that. And I stuck with the family law. Um, I do do a tiny bit of guardianship work, you know, through um, the chancery and probate court, but primarily it's all divorce and family law. And I was lucky that um, there were, you know, attorneys that referred me a lot of work in the beginning that really kind of kept me going and helped me build my practice. And why do you think that is? Why do you think, I mean, I had the same experience when I went into private practice as well on my own. And uh, I was actually sort of just wowed by the goodwill of people referring me cases. And so yeah. um, I know for me, I think it was like, you know, my philosophy is, you know, work hard, be kind, and those things can go hand in hand. Um, yeah. Do you have any of those philosophies or thoughts about how you interact with lawyers, the community, your clients that kind of uh, you feel like has helped grow your business? I think if you're a person that just enjoys talking to others and um, enjoys what you do, then you just naturally sort of exude that confidence and and that generosity, though, to others. So uh, people were very generous to me in terms of referring me work. If they were too busy or they, it was maybe just a case that they just wanted to pass on for whatever reason, maybe they had a conflict, here, call this attorney, you know. I'm sure she'll be able to help you. And then boom, the phone rings and they call me. And so that, you know, a lot of that in the very beginning just helped me get going and and built my practice. And now, you know, there's been times when I've my calendar is just too busy to to take on somebody and I'll refer them to somebody else. And might not be necessarily a lawyer that's just starting, but I think we have the community where we just refer to each other, not because we don't want the cases, but because we just want to help each other. What's the hardest thing have you felt about um, being a solo practitioner? Figuring all the the stuff out, you know. Um, I recently hired an an employee, and you know, doing everything yourself. I don't know. Were, was there ever a time when you did not have an an employee, or did you always have a staff member? I I started with. Um, Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I started with a part-time um, paralegal. Everyone I've had that's worked with me has had a college education in criminal justice. I've had, I've also had okay. um, attorneys that hadn't passed the bar after their clerkships worked for me, but I initially started with a part-time um, person. Um, so I guess the, the simple answer is yes, I've always had somebody at the office, um, okay. you know, during the day. So for me, you know, when I started, I was a one man show, you know, I answered my own phone. I typed my own one work. Woman I made show. Copies. <laughs> one woman show. <laughs> so I did it all. And as a result of that, I was able to really keep a low, uh, overhead budget, you know, mm -hmm. um, but then you reach a point where there's only so much one person can do. And if you want to continue to grow, you have to figure out how to expand and bring on assistance. So I struggled really with, am I ready? How much is it going to cost to have an assistant? And, and then how do I change what I do to make it conducive for somebody else to help me do what I need to do? Um, so that was a big learning curve in the last year or so, I would say, for me. Yeah. I mean, because I came from a firm that there were only really two full-time people and a paralegal, I was able to take a lot of 
what we did in the old firm into the new firm and then fix all the things that I thought needed to be fixed. Um, and then um, I'm sure you know Meg Horner had a criminal practice and I had a criminal practice and we sort of discussed how we're able to organize it to make sure that you know we know if we have all the police reports and all the videos and things like that. Um, right. But uh, yeah, it was definitely um, figuring out systems. And, and when you hire people, you also then need to know whether you're starting to need an HR manual or, you know, uh, holidays off or vacations. Right. I'm not sure if you have, uh, do you have all of that written policy? You probably do. <laughs> I don't. But I had, I had to figure out, in order to, I think in order to get an employee that is um, going to enjoy their job and is going to be valuable to you, you have to offer them something, you know, and that might be, okay, Memorial Day is a paid holiday. You don't have to come in, but I'm going to pay you for the day anyway. Um, you know, things like that, that are an inexpensive, I think, benefit that you can offer to a staff member. Right. I think there's supposed to be like eight to 10 mon you know, national holidays. And yeah, uh, we sort of just do it as it's coming up, you know? Mm -hmm. So, you know, obviously we're off on Monday because it's um, Memorial Day. Um, and I always say we're off the Friday after Thanksgiving. We're, you know, obviously off Christmas. Um, but then like as the Monday's coming up, it's President's Day. Are we off or are we on? And I, right. and I say to myself, do you want to work? Do you not want to work? I'm like, I can always work. I have more work than I know what to do with. But and uh, yeah, and they don't have, I don't have a count of vacation days for them. I say, take vacation when you want to take vacation. I don't have sick days. I say, right. take, but I actually have an amazing staff that doesn't, you know, uh, take advantage of that. I actually have yeah. to tell them to take more vacation than they do. Um, well, my yeah, assistant's uh, part time. So, some of what I offer really isn't as broad as what you have just because you have a more of a full-time staff and you have multiple people working for you than I do. I do. So. I actually um, have extended an offer to a lawyer who is going to start working for me in September. Wow. And, uh, yeah, that was, uh, that was exciting. And Congratulations. Was, uh, thank you. Um, but, uh, even she had questions and I said, well, we're going to have to figure that out because, <laughs> you know, so you're my first attorney that's working. I, and, but the good news is that you get to help grow and build it with me, you know? Right. So, and I think the right person appreciates that opportunity to help you grow. Yes, I agree with you on that. I agree with you on that. Um, but it is interesting, sort of all the things you don't know about a business. I always say I learned how to be a lawyer in law school, but I didn't learn how to run a business. And uh, exactly. I didn't, I also didn't learn how to um, fix a copier. Those are the two things I'm really, you know. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. E oh. Even when we, before you came on and Tom says to me, well, do you have like a, a headphone? I'm thinking, mm, I have earbuds, but I've never paired them to this device. Can you walk me through that? Right. <laughs> Something so simple as that. Tech is not my strong point. Right. But also um, the idea of when to know when to, you know, what technology, what equipment you need. Um, did you have to change anything up during the pandemic based on, you know, the way court was changed during that time? The Really, the main thing that I did was get a um, webcam because my desktop computer did not have a webcam. Mm -hmm. And I don't know if I had a laptop at that time. So I did. I can't I, I did buy a laptop. And then I had a, that had a camera with it. And then I had to get a webcam for my desktop. 
Um, but other than that, I didn't really change too much. And, you know, paid for Zoom, paid for a Zoom membership. But that was it, which I've since given up my Zoom membership because I didn't think I needed it anymore. Do you not have any Zoom court hearings anymore? I'm just curious well, the, regarding the, court, the membership. No, the court will but, send us the link for their Zoom. So I can, I'm can. i using their membership. I didn't need to pay for my own Zoom membership. That's mm -hmm. what I meant. So um, did I ask you what's your favorite part of being your own business owner? You did not. Um, I think I just like making my own choices and having my own dreams and goals and being in charge of that. And, mm -hmm. you know, I mean, the downside is if you make a bad decision, it could be terrible, but I'm pretty conservative in, you know, before, I don't take risks lightly, you know, so, um, you just make it you make a decision you know are you going to spend this much money on this marketing or are you going to spend uh money on these little giveaways for swag or um you know what are you going to spend the money for the practice management software is there a cheaper option out there you know when i first started i researched different companies for that and just picked one that i felt comfortable with and i know there's less expensive programs but you know, I like the one that I have. So those are so you choices initially did use a management program. I did, yeah, you, right away. So yeah, that was one thing that I did. I have one now. It's one year old. Okay. We're four and a half years old as a law. Wow. This is a Melissa Rosenblum. We use Google Docs and Google. Uh, That's what you were doing folders. before now. Okay. Last summer, I had a young college student who uh, attends RIT as a computer science major, also related uh, <laughs> to me. I had him take all of our old files that we had on the computer in our new management program. Did you hear that? It's in, is it said Lansing City. It's like, I know, think it was going is, by my office. Yeah. Oh, was it? I thought it was going yeah. by mine. <laughs> A giant so, truck. Um, yeah, and he transferred everything into our management program, but it took me about three and a half years to feel good enough about paying for that type of service. And um, yeah. we're all digital now, but we are we also have all paper files because um well, I'll just say it this way. I've been practicing twenty six plus years. I need paper still. I can do a oh, lot I have on my computer. In yeah, I can. I yeah. can look at it while I'm in court digitally. But if I'm prepping for trial, if I'm like really fighting uh, a motion or a case that I'm like trying to get all my notes together, it's very old school. So I am as well. I mean, you and I are the same generation, I think, um, and so the paper is essential. And plus, in family law, I mean, we deal with a lot of paper. We're looking at tax returns and pay stubs and insurance forms and credit card statements. And, you know, you need that in your hand, I think, to spread it out on your desk. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to ask you, like, the some kind of general questions for young lawyers. Okay? Okay. Advice that you have for young lawyers who are starting out, um, what do you think that they, they need to do to be successful as in this profession? I think they need to get involved in the local bar associations and attend the events um, because that's really, you know, how I connected and made a lot of networking connections. I started, the first organization I was involved in was the Inns of Court. Um, and I really did that for 20 years or so. I think this is the last, this last year I, I wasn't participating, but, um, that was really my, um, the, the first organization that I was involved in. And I started that when I was a law clerk, mm -hmm. um, where I met a lot of people and made a lot of connections and then, you know, just joined the local Atlanta County bar and 
go to their dinners. I'm also now a member of the Cape May County Bar Association. And even though we're one vicinage, those two bar associations, they operate independently and they really both have a very different feel to them. And so I think that being involved in both has benefits. No, I agree. I was talking to uh, Rachel Goloff, who's the head of the Young Lawyers Division of the Atlanta County Bar Association this year. And uh, we had that conversation of how we might be able to coordinate a little bit more sort of um, activities or events that might incorporate both the Cape May and the Atlantic County Bar. Um, but I agree, there's definitely a different feel for them. And as we say, it's the same vicinage. Anyone who's like listening to the podcast is probably like, <laughs> what does that mean? Which is it's right. such a antiquated term, but uh, there are different vicinages of court. So Salem and Cumberland and Gloucester are a vicinage. I think they're vicinage 15. Right. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, yeah, I agree. Cape May and Atlantic is very, the feel of the bar events are different. Um, I agree for young lawyers to get involved. Um, and I think that uh, right now there seems to be um, uh, a sense that it's not necessary for the younger lawyers, I feel like, um, maybe because they did law school via Zoom and yeah. there's a lot of, you know, uh, technology available, but I don't think it's the same as when you shake somebody's hand and look them in the eye and have a face-to-face -face conversation with them. Yeah, I agree. But you're right. I mean, the the newer students coming out have done so much in a remote setting that it, that's more normal to them than an in-person event. Oh, yeah. You know, I did, I did have a law clerk, a law clerk this year who uh, responded to my job and uh, they Ask before the interview whether this would be a remote, whether remote work was a opportunity or available. Uh -huh. And my staff, which my staff is young, they're they're only twenty five and twenty three. They graduated one graduated three years ago, one graduated two years ago from college. And um, so when they saw that, when they received the "Is this a remote job?" Uh, the response was. So no, and we're not going no and no interview. <laughs> and I said, well, let's let's try to phrase it a little nicer. For example, as in, we're a criminal defense firm. We attend court regularly. You're going to need to make appearances. It's not, right. you know, it's not really optional at this time, you know. Right. Um, and, and listen, the person didn't uh, uh, cancel the interview. Um, so I think it's good because they knew what they wanted. But um, I do think it's just so hard to learn how to be a lawyer if you're not around lawyers. I agree. I agree. Because I, you know, as a younger lawyer, too, when I first started doing even litigation, those were the days where emotions were all scheduled for 9am on a Friday and you would just go and you'd sit and you'd wait and you'd watch. And the more senior attorneys would get taken first because seniority mattered. And, um, but it was enjoyable to sit and watch. And you kind of, I think as a new attorney, you really didn't know what your style was supposed to be. And you were sort of figuring yourself out. And when you get to watch other people, you decide whether you like their style or you want to be like them and you start to emulate a little bit, but dig from within to make it your own. Right. I always say you have to be authentic in court, but it yeah. is good to see other people to see what works and what doesn't. Um, I always tell a story of watching Mario Formiga in trial. We had a trial against each other and um, he's great. He's so animated in court. And he like walks around the courtroom and he's like throwing up his hands. <laughs> he has hair like that. Like he's just constantly up with the hair. And 
Um, it was great to watch. It was great to watch, but um, it was not my style. My style is to teach, you know, and that's my background. And, and so that's right. how I am in court. But it was wonderful to watch. I wish I could emulate it, you know, but it wouldn't have been my authentic self. So, um, right. so my uh, final question, well, there's two. One is... Um, your child or a young adult comes to you and says, I'm thinking about law school. What do you say? Go for it. <laughs> now, my husband would beg to differ. My husband well, thinks that higher education is, uh, I mean, it has its place, but it's overpriced. And, you know, I'm still paying my student loans. I would also tell my child that 20 years out and I still have, 10 more years to go on my student loans. Oh, wow. So, yeah, that is a consideration. Yeah. Well, I have one that's taking the LSATs, and I say, you can live at the house, you can eat my food, right. but it's all on you after that, kid. Um, yeah. All right. Uh, do you have a crazy courtroom story? A crazy courtroom story. I don't know. You don't have a courtroom think, story that you're like, like this is crazy. Uh, I can't. Make I almost, up this I stuff. almost passed out in court uh, one time. If that <laughs> is that a crazy courtroom story? It w it would have been uh, crazier if you did pass out and then you still yeah. won. Those would be the good things, right? <laughs> Who were you in front of? Judge Persky. Was back he, in the day. Uh huh. Was he, it was, did you have to say, I need to sit down? Yeah. I, it was one of those moments where I was on my feet speaking and it was in the middle of our oral argument. And, you know, all of a sudden, like everything's starting to get black and I could just tell, like, I'm, I'm going to go down. And I think I just, it was summer. It was hot. I hadn't eaten much for breakfast, busy, hot courtroom. You know, there's a lot of people in there and I just said, Judge, I'm sorry, but I think I'm going to pass out. And I just plopped down into the seat. And I did not lose consciousness. I just sat down. Um, and with that, he said, OK, take a break. And I literally just left all my documents on the table. And I went out into the like vestibule area. And then somebody went and got me some orange juice from the uh, coffee shop. And I was fine. And then I went back in and continued. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah. Gotcha. All right. Anything you want to add? No, I'm just, this is really a pleasure. And um, I love your podcast. As you know, I always, I always listen and I always give you my feedback. I think this is a great venue and you're making such a great brand for yourself that I admire a lot of what you do. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, thank you. As I said, when we started, I always like talking to you about business. I, you know, really admired when you went out on your own. I was uh, a little envious that you were free. Yeah. Um, Thank you. But it did help me a little um, when it was my turn. Again, I don't know if I was brave, but, you know, I had all those issues that you talk about, you know. Yeah. I had four kids. I, you know, was sort of responsible for making a certain amount of money you know and uh, mm -hmm. there's that stress level but uh and i would never go back now i can't imagine ever you know going back to a firm i mean there's stability there there's predictability but i just love having my own office yeah i feel that way too i think i think uh i wish i knew how much i would have loved it and you know i love i still love practicing law but i also love what i'm building i love the office environment that we we have here um it is you know just an amazing place to be and i think my staff loves coming in to work because of it and i i sort That's of wonderful. am really proud of all of that you know in addition yeah. to my merch and my brand <laughs> <laughs> that's all part of it though it is it is well thank you so much and i look forward to us talking again and uh 
Thank you all for listening to the Mighty Merc Podcast. Absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. We hope you enjoyed this episode of the Mighty Merp Podcast. This podcast is not a source of legal advice. No two legal cases are the same. Contact an attorney if you require legal assistance.